Hello, welcome again to U.S. History One. This is going to be the first of two videos for the series, and we're going to first look at the Antebellum North, and then we're going to look at the second video at the Antebellum South. Now, Antebellum, and just so you know what that means, that just means pre-war. So if you hear anybody talk about Antebellum, that means pre-Civil War. And the 40-year period before the Civil War, it is the period of most urbanization, the quickest, the fastest urbanization in American history. Now, the number of towns in 1820 that had more than 2,500 inhabitants, it's only 56. But by the time you get to 1850, that number is up to 350. Now, I know that doesn't sound like a lot. You're probably thinking it's 350 towns of 2,500 people in Metro Atlanta alone. But you have to think that in 1820, the United States didn't have cities, really at all. New York City is going to be the largest city by 1850. It's going to have over a million people when it combines with Brooklyn. Now, even though these cities are big, even though we are, we are starting to get this urbanization, people are going to move in and out of these cities constantly. It's estimated that half of the people of New York City moved out every 10 years. So there's a quick and a rapid turnover of people. What was it like in these cities? Well, the physical setting, it was crowded. We don't have any high rises yet. I think the biggest buildings are like three and four stories. There's lots of people living in very little space. There are problems with water and sewer. Uh, water and sewer service were actually left to private companies at first. So if you didn't pay your bill, you didn't get water. And if you didn't pay your bill, you didn't get sewers. But eventually the cities are going to take that over and make it a, a normal service that they offer. Police and fire is in private hands at first. It starts with night watchmen, private security patrols, and bucket brigades. Eventually it's going to become professional, especially with the police, and that's going to be taken over by the government. Every once in a while now you get fire stations that are volunteer run, but even they get funding from the, the community. There are several different types of entertainment. There's the theater, and notice this theater is spelled with an R-E instead of an E-R. And that's because we're talking primarily stage plays. Uh, Shakespeare, for example, is performed for all sorts of different communities, all sorts of different financial backgrounds. Sports consists of horse racing, boxing, running, and early baseball. You get urban clubs such as sporting clubs, social clubs, the Freemasons, things like that. And then you have entertainment for lower classes found out in the streets. And these street gatherings, you get talking, chatting, political rallies, you name it happening in northern cities as well. This is also a time of big change for the way people live. Uh, people begin to live apart from their work. They're no longer living where their home and the business are combined. People are leaving home to go work in factories. As more poor people concentrate into the cities and as the pollution gets worse, the wealthy elite gradually start to move further and further away from the city center. And that's a trend that continues all the way up until I think the 1960s, 1970s, and it starts to reverse somewhat. Now these wealthy elite, they're moving away from the smells of the city, the dangers of the city, they're moving away from the immigrants, the migrants, the lower classes. These wealthy elite, they see the lower class people as polluting society and they see them as troublemakers. This is going to be a period where horse-drawn streetcars 
began and we started to get early forms of public transportation. And there's a lot of wealth inequality too. Um, like for example, in New York City, the wealthiest 5% of the people own more than 80% of everything. So the rich are gonna control large parts of the wealth in New York City and in other cities throughout the North. You get improvements in manufacturing, improvements in machine tools, and that leads to mass production of products, reduced labor costs, lower prices, faster development of products. And as I said last week, the world really becomes a smaller place because of the telegraph. News can spread throughout the city quickly. News can spread between communities very quickly. Orders can be placed, you name it, with the telegraph. Now, for most people in the city, daily life still has to do a lot with the ups and downs of the economy, but there are periods of normality in there as well. There are changes in the country as well. New inventions are going to affect agriculture. One of these new inventions is the mechanical reaper that is created by Cyrus McCormick in 1834. And it's gonna separate the wheat from the, the husks and make harvesting much, much quicker than by hand. John Deere, he did not invent the tractor. He invented the steel tip plow and that goes into production in 1837. Now the reason that was so important is because in the Midwest, it allowed farmers to get underneath the, the crust of the soil to the black dirt underneath. And that meant that for the first time, prairies, which were originally seen as American deserts, can be open to farming. Uh, more crops are grown, um, bigger crops are grown, and that's because of the introduction of better animal feed, the use of chemical fertilizers, and production rates increase throughout the Midwest. And speaking of the Midwest, um, the Midwest really grows economically because of the railroads. The railroads are gonna tie farms to the markets. The railroads are gonna tie places like Chicago and St. Louis and Milwaukee to the bigger cities along the East Coast. And Chicago and Milwaukee are going to become by far the most important cities in the Midwest. I also need to talk about this thing called true womanhood. This is mostly a northern phenomenon, and it's frankly kind of strange. There's this growing apart of men and women's lives as the moral economy breaks down and we switch into this market economy. Uh, and these changes, they're going to lead to these separate spheres of influence, these separate worlds that men and women work in. And for women, religion, education, morality, and domestic skills are going to begin to overshadow the economic function that women have in the household. And this is going to develop this true womanhood move. This is almost a, a counter action to the female workers of Lowell, Massachusetts. So you have true womanhood. A true woman has piety. It says religion is exactly what a woman needs, where it gives her that dignity that best suits her dependence. A woman is supposed to be pious and dependent upon a man. A true woman has purity. Terrible consequences befall women who lose their purity before marriage. So if you're caught having sex before marriage, uh, you can go mad. When you get pregnant, you can lose a child or some other bad thing can happen. A true woman is submissive. And submissiveness is the most feminine of virtues. A woman was expected to submit to her husband or her father if she was unmarried. And then domesticity. A woman's true place is at her own fireside. 
She is to provide a haven of purity and comfort to men struggling in the wicked world. A woman's place is supposed to be at home, waiting on her husband without question. Now, those four cardinal sins, you may have differing opinions on them. I would say most people would question those today. But at the time, that's what was expected of a woman. Now, there's a real emphasis placed on religion. There's a real emphasis placed on education. It's all about domestic skills, morality. That is what made a woman important. There are complete magazines. There are books. There are church sermons all dedicated to this movement of true womanhood. There are many women out there that openly and fully embrace true womanhood as well. Uh, Catherine Beecher, Sarah Joseph Hale, Lydia Sigourney. These are three early adopters or three women who pushed this true womanhood movement. Now, Catherine Beecher, uh, she was an American educator. You, you have experienced her influence on the world, even if you don't realize it. She was one of the leading proponents of incorporating kindergarten into education. And she thought it was the public school's responsibility to teach moral, physical, and intellectual development of children. We have Sarah Josepha Hale. Uh, you also know her, and when I tell you why she's famous, you're going to look at your childhood completely differently. Sarah Joseph Hale, she was a writer and an editor, and she is the person who wrote Mary Had a Little Lamb. Now think of that through the cult of domesticity. Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb. Mary had a little lamb, her fleece was white as snow. There's your purity. Everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. There you have your submissiveness and your domesticity. Mary Had a Little Lamb is a song about this true womanhood movement. Sarah Joseph Hale was also responsible for making Thanksgiving into a national holiday. Now, what about Lydia Sigourney? She was an American poet, and she was one of the most popular writers of her day. She wrote all about piety, grace, religious life. And she wrote about true womanhood, and she encouraged other women to become poets. Now, what about the publications? Well, you've got Goody's Lady Books. It was a magazine published by Louis A. Goody from Philadelphia from 1830 all the way till 1878. Goody's Lady Book is where Mary Had a Little Lamb was first published. Sarah Joseph Hale was its editor for many, many years. The Ladies' Repository, it was a monthly magazine based out of Cincinnati. It was published by the Methodist Episcopal Church, which is today the United Methodist Church. And it was all about literature, art, the doctrines of Methodism, and how women should be these pious and pure beings. Now, finally, you have the Young Ladies' Book. Young Ladies' Book, it was instructions on how to be a woman, how to curtsy, how to talk, how to place your feet. It was all about a young woman's appearance and posture and that they had to meet the expected true womanhood look. Now there's some other changes that happen because of women at this time. A family start to get smaller. There is the use of early birth control. There is the use of early abortion. Women knew what medicines to take or not take to stop or end a pregnancy. There's this emphasis on how children are raised. Technological changes that are coming in are changing the way housekeeping is done. And it's 
all about just a cultural look at women. They don't, they don't contribute economically anymore. And women are going to be bound together in this sphere through their common experiences, what they go through in their childhood, uh, what it's supposed to be to be a true woman. And a woman can start her own sphere. A woman graduates to basically independence when she gets married and has a kid and then she can start her own sphere or go join her own sphere and leave the sphere of her mother. Now women in urban settings, they start these aid movements, they start these aid groups or almost like support groups for these women. Um, but it's interesting that this true womanhood movement doesn't really make it to the South very much. And that's because in the Southern household, the women remain integrated into the household, except for in some of the urban areas. Uh, the women are still taking a large part in the economy. And it takes a little bit longer. It takes till after the Civil War before these spheres develop in the South. Now we have to look at religion too. Beginning in the 1800s and going into the 1830s, there is this movement called the Second Great Awakening. And it is really centered around upstate New York, specifically Rochester, New York of all places. This Second Great Awakening, it's supposed to bring people back to the church. Uh, it's this attempt to reignite religion and make it more personal. There was this thought, there was this feeling that religion had become too calculated, that it had become too money-driven. So you have all of these people in the North, specifically upstate New York, who are trying to bring the feeling back into the church, much like Jonathan Edwards or George Whitefield did a couple years earlier. So you have these this nationwide wave of revivals, and out of these revivals, you get the creation of the Methodist church, and you get the creation of the Baptist church, and then they just grow stronger and stronger and stronger from there. Closely aligned with these, with the Second Great Awakening, are these utopian movements. And you have the Mormons, who are founded by Joseph Smith. According to tradition, Joseph Smith, who grows up in Rochester, New York, uh, he's going to base a new denomination of Christianity on the Book of Mormon, which he claims he found. And he's going to create the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now, he quickly gains a lot of followers. He quickly gains a lot of enemies. And he moves further and further westward to escape persecution from those who didn't agree with him. In 1843, Smith creates even more controversy by claiming that polygamy is okay. And by 1844, Smith is jailed in Illinois under charges of treason. Now, while in jail in Western Illinois, Smith and his brother are removed from the jail and murdered by a mob. And Brigham Young is going to take over. Brigham Young is going to move the Mormon West to Utah, where they're going to settle down. Now, for the Shakers, uh, they're kind of strange. This is a movement that's going to begin in the late 1700s. It's centered, once again, on upstate New York, and they believe very, very strongly in perfection. And the Shakers, they give up all their property. They say everything is community-owned. They believe in burying themselves to... Um,
how do I want to say this? They really bury themselves into their their faith. They think that they will literally bring the kingdom of heaven to earth, not metaphorically or anything like that. They, it's like they think that you know, the earth is going to connect with another planet, and then all of the believers of Christianity are going to be taken away or something like that. I don't really get it very much. Another weird thing about these shakers is they believe in absolute chastity. Sex is a sin, pure and simple. Whether you are unmarried or married, they don't care. They will not do a marriage for you. So you have these shakers. They believe in absolute chastity. They believe in bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. And if they can't, procreate, how are they going to expand? Well, they believe that others would join them willingly and the sect would continue. Well, would you be surprised if I told you that the Shakers pretty much died out by the beginning of the Civil War? No, I, I didn't think I would fool you with that. There are these people that are called transcendentalists that are happening or living at the same time, and they're their ideas are going to be loosely expressed on British Romanticism. Uh, if you've ever had a Brit Lit class or a, a World Lit class, you've probably talked about this period of time, this period of uh, transcendentalism, this period of Romanticism. Transcendentalists, they have this theory where reason and understanding are different. Basically, reason is an individual's ability to grasp beauty and truth by giving full expression to their instincts, their emotions, and their understanding. And the self, the inner self, becomes the center of life, the center of thought, and it's not scientific reasoning, it's not scientific modeling in any way that affects the way humans are looked at or the way that they're treated. Some of the members of this transcendentalist movement are Ralph Waldo Emerson, Bronson Alcott, Margaret Fuller, Henry David Thoreau, and they move together to a place called Brooks Farm, and it's this experimental community located in West, uh, West Roxbury, Massachusetts. Uh, everybody was supposed to share equally in the work, which meant that everybody could share equally in the free time. Uh, tensions are going to break out almost from the start. Fire breaks out, destroys the main building in 1847, and then eventually it starts to fall apart. Believe it. Eventually, the farm is destroyed for good in 1847, and the residents say, you know what, I've had enough, and they don't rebuild it. This period of reform is when Sunday liquor laws begin to come into being. Uh, it's believed that alcohol was the demon rum, and employers and employees closed pubs and closed bars. This was supported by employees, or I'm sorry, employers. This is supported by tax collectors, of course. Employers like it because they say that um, you know, they don't want to pay 20 to 30 percent alcohol taxes. So workers try to offset the price as much as they can. There were some loopholes for alcohol. Um, if it was for a medicinal purpose, then you could still drink or possess alcohol, but for everybody else, it would become illegal. Dorothea Dix is going to tour prisons throughout Massachusetts, and she's going to start the criminal justice reform program that is ongoing today. 
So Dorothea Dix is going to go and visit reform asylum. She's going to go check on inmates and find that they've been caged in closets, been caged in cages, stalls, pens. They're often chained naked with rods and they're being lashed for their lack of obedience. Dorothea Dix is eventually going to make her, her report public, and that's going to lead to more humane treatment of prisoners, orphans, and those with special needs throughout New England. Public school becomes a thing at this time. In 1800, there's no public school outside of New England, but by 1860, every state in the Union has some form of a paper or, or not. And the person who really brings education to students is named Horace Mann. Horace Mann is the head of the Massachusetts State Board of Education, and he's going to claim that a well-educated population is essential to maintaining democracy. When he opens up his public schools, he establishes a minimum school year of six months. From uh, formalized training of teachers, and he's going to ask the schools to emphasize reading and arithmetic. Public education is going to be very well accepted in the North because businessmen, they feel like ed education can be used to teach them what they want to know. Work hard and you'll succeed. Accept the instructions of your superiors without question, and do not envy the rich because the God will support the poor. Now, last but not least, we have the birth of the abolition movement going on too. As early as 1817, we have the formation of the American Colonization Society. And the idea was for gradual compensated emancipation to a Hey, we can do this. So the former slave owners are going to have some sort of restitution, some sort of payment, but the freed slaves aren't going to live in the United States. They're going to be taken back to Africa. Now, there are a couple of problems with this. The African-American slave is no longer an African. They are of the African-American community. Not only that, but these people that they want to return to Africa don't speak the modern language, may or may not know the, the modern con conditions or the word I'm trying to think of. Um, they don't know what reactions to expect, things like that. Now you have the newspaper called The Liberator that is opened in upstate New York, and The Liberator, published by William Lloyd Garrison, is going to become the voice of the abolitionist movement. And Garrison is going to call for immediate emancipation and immediate equal rights for Blacks. He's going to argue that white Americans should stop supporting or participating in the government because it was immoral and illegal. What was illegal? You were he, um, what do I want to say? He believed it was illegal because it didn't specifically say in the Constitution that you could do this. Northern African Americans are going to support Garrison's efforts with a high degree of, of uh, support. Now, white and black abolitionists are going to differ on what they want. Uh, whites seek to only abolish slavery. They have no thought on treating African Americans as equals. Black abolitionists, often led by a gentleman named Frederick Douglass, uh, they're going to push for full equality. Uh, this difference in abolitionist movements and this difference in abolitionist ideas is going to cause some 
some uh, uprisings, some violence in some places. Abolitionists are even going to go so far as to petition Congress for stopping the, this movement from happening. And um, unfortunately, it's going to take several more years before the idea of slavery and black abolitionism truly takes over. All right, that is it for the first video. I'll have the second video recorded shortly. And um, if you have any questions, concerns, or comments, please make sure that you email me. We'll talk to you in a little bit.